I almost feel like young Jamie from the Rogan oh, podcast oh. setting all this up. Young Jamie, bring that up. Yeah. <laughs> That's my role. Well, let me... It's working. It's working. Oh, because we're live. Hang on. Let me... Uh... There you go. Apparently... I feel like young Jamie from the Rogan oh, podcast oh. setting all this up. Oh. Sorry, let me get rid of the time delay. Okay, yeah, we've got a bit of a time delay on the live anyway, so that's fine. Let me uh, fire up the link to everyone. Hang on, hang on, I don't know why that just did that. So there's no pressure for me and you, Alex. We can just sit here and talk. They're doing all the tech stuff and, uh, yeah, we can just have fun. Cool. How long have you been training? Um, myself, um, I always say that it's one more year than Pete and Robin give me credit for. So I, I think it's uh, it's nine years or eight years. They always say it's eight or seven. Wait, why is that? <clears throat> I think I started training when my little boy was one. Um, mm -hmm. But I think they might be accurate. And I started when he was two. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. But no, so it's coming up for eight years now. Mm, very best cool. decision of my life taking that first jujitsu class let me ask you this was it um was it for any like deep reason or was it just kind of a whim we're supposed to be asking you these questions sir. <laughs> um, it's not about me it's about <laughs> you this 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 podcast but let's let's go um uh i always since being tiny wanted to do a martial art because I had some big brothers, big cousins, you know, older like family members that I looked up to that always trained martial arts. Mm -hmm. And I can remember the stories from when I was small where they used to fight for England and they competed in competitions with some film stars in Hollywood now. And, mm -hmm. and it was always fascinating to me. But for whatever reason, I just never, ever got the opportunity to, to do it when I was small. And then I got a job which... I couldn't run the risk of any broken noses or black eyes, um, obviously with these fantastic good looks. And I, uh, I, I decided that the only martial art that I could do was one where I wasn't going to be getting, you know, punched in the face constantly. And a friend of mine suggested trying jujitsu. And uh, yeah, first class with the with the two guys on the on the screen, and um, never ever looked back. That's awesome. Yeah, good. Longest running student. What's that? Longest running student. Oh. So you guys have, um, how long have you guys been open? Um, uh, mm, mm. Uh, us as we are, five years. Mm -hmm. uh, that's about two weeks time, it will be five years. Uh, before that, Pete and I were teaching for the original uh, UK affiliate. Mm -hmm. He decided to part ways with um, Master Sauer. Mm -hmm. uh, so we kind of take over after that. Okay. That's the very, that's the very low political version. <laughs> there's always that, right? There's always, <laughs> yeah, there's always stuff we'll, we'll talk about like when we're off the air. <laughs> <laughs> but you're about to celebrate your, your fifth birthday, right? Fifth birthday, yeah. We, everyone was supposed to get together and have like all good, good fun and everything and uh, now it'll probably just be a Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's I, I have a feeling like whenever this blows over um there's going to be just a lot of celebration and just pent up like uh i don't know cabin fever and stuff that we we just gonna have to get over i mean i mean in the states there have been like there's weddings graduations uh you know sometimes even funerals that have just been pushed yeah. so yeah, it's all been times. hmm all been cancelled now. All the uh, sort of, I think the only thing you can do now is funerals, but they can't really uh, stop that. Mm. Funerals, but limited to five people at the moment. Oh but, wow! Mm, so it's, yeah, really, really um, challenging situations people find themselves in. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, we've got to look forward to the uh, to the days when this is is behind us and uh, get back on the mats and uh, strangle each other. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> So you asked me that question, Alex, about, you know, why did I start training? What, what about you? What, when did you start? Why did you start? 
Uh, super boring answer. <laughs> um, honestly, it was a whim. Uh, I had just graduated from college um, and started my first job. And uh, in college, I don't know how university is in, uh, in the UK or anything, but um, there's quite a bit of walking. So like from my apartment to my first class in the morning was like a half an hour, 45 minute walk. And so you get a lot of exercise throughout your day. But uh, I went from that to like a desk job. Uh, I'm a software dev now, and um, I, uh, I don't know, just the sedentary lifestyle started packing on the pounds, and uh, I would be taking trips to the uh, soda machine and snack machine, not even because I was hungry or thirsty, because I was bored, and uh, in about six months of my job, I put on 20 pounds over my college weight. I was like, damn, I got to do something else. I mean, I was going to the, the uh, you know, workplace gym and lifting some weights, but definitely wasn't doing enough. Um, so I was interested in jujitsu from the time I was in high school. I remember just doing a Google search way back when in like, um, shoot, that must've been 98, 99 when I was in high school. I graduated in 2000 um, and jujitsu came up. It was like, I, I heard of the UFC and things like that, but uh, I didn't even know that I grew up in the same town as the Gracies. Like, I didn't know that the Gracie Academy, the original institution of jujitsu in America was in my hometown where I was growing up. Um, so I don't know, it was always in the back of my mind. Uh, went in on a random Thursday night, uh, January 4th, 2007. I remember that. And uh, Hiron taught my first class. And yeah, I was, I don't think I was sold on the first day, but uh, within a few classes, uh, I saw that there was definitely like a, a science to it and they had a system in place. They had a, they had a curriculum and they, the way they explained things was definitely uh, in terms of um, principles that ought to work, not um, techniques that if you're athletic enough, they should work. And I, I was sold on that, at least initially. I was like, okay, I can, uh, I've always had like a, a mind for, um, systematic thinking. So I was like, okay, if these people care to, um, you know, structure something that seems so, um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's hard to define, right? Like, how do you teach a person art? How do you, how do you, uh, like, where do you begin? You can start with certain things like, uh, I don't know, um, perspective and shading and, and, you know, color theory. But then at a certain point, it's, it's a big mess. It's a big tapestry. And it's like, I don't know how, how you, you break it apart into digestible components and how you convey the, um, the artistry part of it, the choices you make instead of, you know, the things that you have at your disposal. You know, you can teach a person how tools work and what they're meant for, but being a good um, craftsman is, is a different thing altogether, it seems. So they seem to have that, at least for, uh, beginners wrapped up into a nice package that I could digest. So I was hooked. Um, and I remember, I don't know if you guys have beginner and advanced classes. Um, and I don't know what like the, the division is between the two of them. But at the Gracie Academy, when I started, um, they had their combatives curriculum. And then as soon as you took all of their classes, all their beginner classes, I think it was three or four times, then you just automatically went into the advanced curriculum. And um, that was like the first major hurdle where I might have quit. Like, cool. um, because the, the combatants was very digestible. Like I could study for it. I could, you know, they didn't have a test at that moment, but um, um, I, I could be tested on that stuff. Uh, when I got into the advanced curriculum at that time, they hadn't uh, created the master cycle yet, which is basically, you know, a, a system, a curriculum, a progressive curriculum for the rest of jujitsu. You know, if combatives is the first 36 techniques you learn, you know, master cycle uh, within the Gracie, Gracie University now is like the rest of everything. And so I remember I was so excited to get into actual sparring and then like nothing that I had learned for the first eight months was working at all. Like nothing would work. They taught us a, um, this kneeling guard pass. And as soon as I broke open somebody's guard, they jumped triangle on me. I'm like, well, I don't understand why I learned that kneeling guard pass to begin with, you know, like everything seemed pointless until um, I, I kind of got the idea that 
this is this was the journey from here on out like there is um it's always it's always uh kind of reassuring to start from a, a place of i guess uh precision like this is how it's going to be this is how it works this is why things work but where the rubber meets the road um it gets a little messier and then that's just the game from then on out you know um it your ego takes a bruising but you know you know how it goes <laughs> yep. yeah do you think so that's the biggest thing with um obviously everyone talks about it in jiu-jitsu about the blue belts just disappearing like they've they've learned magic yeah <laughs> do you think it's like, yeah do you th obviously do you think that's kind of what causes it with most people that the, they just see that massive oh now i don't i i thought i knew a bit and now i realize i know absolutely nothing i'm starting all over again almost from scratch mm -hmm. conscious unconscious or incompetence right yeah yeah so like um definitely they, that was that was i remember it so vividly i i talked to henner uh the day after my first my first advanced class i remember talking to him um like yeah um nothing works henner <laughs> and, then, and he kind of looked at me he looked at me with an expression that made me at first at least feel stupid for asking the question he was like what did you expect right and then I was like, shit, I don't know. Like, you know, maybe, um, maybe to see some, I don't know, uh, to see something, something work at least uh, in, in part in the way I expected it to. And then he came to me like a couple of days later, uh, realizing that perhaps um, I, I was dissatisfied with that answer, you know, his response. And he's like, okay, look, so you've learned this certain chunk and uh, it's like a buoy, right? Like you have this buoy and if you're out in the open ocean, this buoy can can ensure that you can survive, right? You can cling to it until rescue comes or But you have to understand now that you're in the ocean and the ocean is so expansive that, um, you know, it takes a while to get other buoys, get other techniques, other, other things under your belt so that you develop a certain level of comfort in the water. And not only that, but with time, with time, you'll learn to swim better between these buoys as well. And so having that, that, having that metaphor really helped me um, re, in, in, in mathematics, they call it normalizing, renormalizing your uh, expectations. And so, um, yeah, that was huge. It was still, I don't know what it was. Maybe I was, maybe I was young and, and headstrong still enough to want to just figure it out. You know, I remember setting the first goal, like, just get to your blue belt, get to your blue belt and, and you will have arrived and, and, and then we can, we can, you know, re reevaluate at that point. And then I remember once I got my blue belt, I didn't like the way that, um, purple belts could handle me so easily. And so I'm like, okay, um, purple belt, purple belts, middle of the pack, you break in the middle of the pack, it'd be fine. But as you guys probably know, once you get to purple belt, then you're a lifer, right? So, um, from purple belt to black, it could be, I don't know, untold number of years, but once you get to purple, you're pretty much over the biggest hump there is. You uh, you said when you first went into that that first class, it was, you know, you saw there was like a system, there's, there's the curriculum, but then you also spoke about artistry. Mm -hmm. what was, it, was, it the, was it the model and the, the flow, the system that, that attracted you, or was it that I mean, at that point in time, could you see the, the potential for being an artist using jiu-jitsu? I couldn't. Uh, so most of my education, like, I, I don't know when this started. It was just like, I always gravitated toward the hard sciences, math, and things where things can be very black and white. You know, there's, there's at least in American education, there you're not taught to be creative. They don't teach for creativity. They teach for like, it's very industrial revolution kind of processes where it's like, here's the material you need to know. I'm gonna, you know, you're gonna be tested on these things. They give you the test, you pass, it's all good. Um, the, the artistry part of it is something that I always noticed, but it always remained this kind of like, this mystery to me, this, this intangible quality that I always wanted, but no one could ever teach for, like no one ever could, you know, codify it for me. And um, I would say at the Gracie Academy or Gracie University now, 
they do their best to do it in terms of principles. And principles are really powerful in terms of that, right? Because um, if you understand a move, you know that you've memorized a certain sequence of, uh, uh, or a technique, you've memorized a certain sequence of uh, movements. If you understand a principle, you understand why those movements work. But then there's this other level where you try to get principles to leave technique altogether, you know, to like, to quote uh, Bruce Lee, no technique as technique, right? You, you First you have to imitate and then you learn how to innovate. Um, that part, capturing that uh, I've tried to do, like as a, as a teacher, I've tried to try and come up with a, a framework to do it. And um, I, would have I would love to teach seminars, like just on the, uh, on the art part of it, you know, of the martial art. You know, every seminar that I've ever been to was like this technique, this technique, this technique. And then like, they'll show you a sequence, you know, like, and it's beautiful, but in the end you're left with perhaps um, another chapter in your book of techniques that goes on a, you know, on a shelf. And then hopefully the, the hope is the next time you're in the middle of a spar session, you'll be able to access that information at the right time and make the right choices and ad lib in the, in the appropriate ways. Um, but that is the biggest leap, right? Like the, the problem for you guys now is probably not, and for me as well, is not a lack of technique or a lack of resources, right? There are DVD sets, YouTube videos, you know, seminars you can go to. There's so much out there, but how do you distill that into a, an ability to, in the moment, pick out and, and make the right choices? Yes. Right? That's What's the secret? <laughs> I try to I try to convey this in. So, do you guys know about my blog? Shameless Ooh. plug here, but I nice. have a blog. Nice. Are allowed. Go for it. Go, go, go. <laughs> uh, it's it's uh, groundedgrit.com, and um, I have an article series called uh, Jujitsu Microcosmos in there. You should skip to really the third article in that series. When I started it, I had the, like these grand plans. Um, but really the, the, the first video episode I did for the blog, uh, kind of encapsulates it. Um, so I don't know how long winded an answer you want to have, but, um, I have what's called a, um, a triple C framework for, uh, for trying to tap into your creativity and arrive at the best choices in the moment. Right. So. The analogy is um, if you play music, right? You can learn about scales. I don't know if you guys play instruments. Anybody? Yeah. Billy, yeah. Bill's, just, Bill's <laughs> literally just started playing the guitar. Two weeks into trying to learn how to play. <laughs> okay. Robin, anything? I played the recorder at school. <laughs> <laughs> I did as well, middle school. Um, okay, so the idea is uh, you can learn scales, uh, you can learn about rhythm and tempo and things like that. Um, but sparring is like, okay, um, here's, here's your backup band. They're going to play and, you know, you play with them. And then you just kind of feel lost. It's like, okay, well, um, I know this scale should fit this key and uh, I'll try not to play out of, out of rhythm at a time. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, so there are the technique and knowledge should guide you, but it shouldn't uh, dictate you. You know what I mean? Like if I got in and I played scales, sure it could match whatever is going on in the background, but it would seem like the furthest thing from a song. Um, I play guitar as well. I don't know if you see in my- No, we, I, I saw the collection. Yeah, so um, I, I first picked it up and I was way into like, like late eighties shred, right? Um, but then at a certain point, it's uh, and this is a, this is a, a criticism that I, I, I buy a hundred percent. At a certain point, that eighties shred kind of turns into a little bit of like, uh, what, what would Brit say, wankery? <laughs> you know, like it's 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 just sentiment. <laughs> It's just skills, right? There's no, there's no heart in it. There's just look what I can do, right? And um, that's not, that's not effective jujitsu. It's, it's not effective at all. So 
back to the triple C framework. So this is a, this is a, a methodology for you to leave technique behind, just for you to not focus on technique, but think about what the moment demands of you and how to make the best optimal decision for right now. So uh, triple C, because there's three directives, three C's. The first one is connection. And uh, I remember learning about connection in a Hickson seminar, right? Um, we typically think if we're touching somebody, if we have contact with them, we have connection, but that's not true. That's just contact. Connection is where you have a little bit of tension in the system. So if this was my partner's body and I was touching them, um, connection would be just putting a little push into it, just a little bit, you know, create a little tension. And uh, if I have a grip, maybe don't just grip something, but have a little bit of a pull, right? And if I'm in an open guard situation, let's say, uh, I might have my feet on your hips and some grips on your geese, and I'm pulling and pushing at the same time. All about establishing tension, okay? This tension is really important because if you were to close your eyes, um, any movement by your partner would be detectable to you because of vacuums created in that tension, right? So if I'm pushing against my partner and he's pushing against me and all of a sudden I feel a vacuum, I can feel it, I can sense it, and before I can say it in words, I know he's moving away from me, right? Because I'm pushing him, there's a vacuum, um, he, I know he's moving away from me. Similarly, in a pull versus a pull, if there's a vacuum, it's because he's moving toward me, right? So you connect to the guy, you can, in a tactile way, be 100% aware of the things that he's doing or maximally aware of the things that he's doing. Um, he may be moving his little toe and you can't feel it, but you know, that's hardly pertinent sometimes. Um, the, the idea is to maximize your awareness in any given moment. Even if it's not perfect awareness, it's the best you can get, okay? The second C is uh, confound. So confound, if I could sum it up in a sentence, means nothing for free. Um, if, I, if, I, if I have a grip, let's say, and a guy intends to pull away from me, I don't wanna just let him go. Right. Even if I want to move with his momentum, so to speak, and I intend to push him away, I don't want to do it the instant he decides he wants to move away. I want to make him work just a little bit, because if every movement of his costs him uh, some degree of um, missed expectation or, um, you know, increased use of strength or um, just some psychological frustration, then he'll never be able to precisely know what it will take to achieve, you know, what he aims to do, or if indeed he'll be able to achieve it at all. Okay, so connect, so you maximize your awareness, confound, so that you can set up surprises. And then the third C is uh, capitalize, where you start to deliver on those surprises. So um, capitalize is the most complex of the, of the triple C framework. There's three, um, there's three possible definitions of it, okay? Uh, sometimes when you confound your opponent and he can't do what he wants to do, he'll switch strategies. So um, I have a narrated spar session that accompanies this article of mine um, where I'm, I'm sparring with a friend of mine who trains in uh, one of our affiliates in Japan. And he's in my open guard. Uh, he just broke away from my closed guard and I'm hugging his neck and I'm trying to grab onto his legs and he's just backing away from me. Um, I am not letting him back away for free. I'm trying to hold him in. For what purpose, I don't know. But at a certain point, I realize I'm not able to hold him anymore and his head slips out. You know, he puts his hand on my elbow and he slips out of the neck hug. The moment he stands up, my feet go like this behind his ankles. I shove him by the hips and he just falls straight backward, okay? I was capitalizing by, oh, no, 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 sorry. The moment he slips from me, I scoot forward, I hug his legs, and it, it's like a sloppy double leg takedown from my, from my butt, actually, right? He's just, he's backing up a little bit. I bind his legs together, and he's not able to scoot back anymore, so he falls on his butt. Um, this is the first de definition of capitalize, and it's to seize the territory that they relinquish in changing strategies, right? If he had... If he had um, tried to push forward uh, still, that wouldn't have been the move for me. But because he was backing up, he was creating this vacuum that I could feel, and I just filled the vacuum. I grabbed him on his way out, and he fell on his butt. Um, seize territory when they change strategies. And they will 
always, always give you extra territory when they try to, when they move their focus from this move to this move. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, second definition of capitalize is sometimes you uh, confound them to the point where they get really frustrated and they're like, hell no, this isn't going to work on me. And they decide to just throw everything that they have in it. Okay. Um, an example in one of the roles that I did with this same friend, um, he was side mounted on me. So his head is here. I have my forearm in his neck. My hand is gripping his shoulder. And this other hand is kind of shadowing his arm. I don't know if you guys can imagine it in your head. And what I do is I bridge toward him. I flare my elbow and I kind of put this frame in his neck. And it creates a little space. Not enough necessarily for me to bring my legs in and replace my guard. But it was, he had been in that, in that, situation where he couldn't get a neck hug and couldn't get his head close to me for let's say 10, 20 seconds. So when I added a little bit more space on top of that, um, he decided not today and he drives his body forward and I could feel my arms would have collapsed underneath that. So, um, I accepted the defeat of not being able to push him out as far as I wanted. And I realized he was giving me a gift in another form, which is commitment. Right? He was committing hard to, to bringing his weight back over me, at which point my frames turned into a, a grab under the armpit. And then I stripped my hips into him, underneath him, and I just started pushing him by his armpit down my legs. And that's the second definition of, of capitalize. When they come at you with overwhelming force and they're going to break through whatever hurdles you threw in their way, that's a perfect time to redirect their energy change where the where the battlefield is they're going to accomplish their goal right in that they stopped you from creating that space that you wanted to create but in so doing they had to give you so much in, an, in, in another dimension that if you are aware enough if you're present enough to seize that gift instead then it's sort of like um it, it's sort of like how the art of negotiation is supposed to work so i go off on a lot of tangents i do I, I, you, before I had a kid, I used to read a lot. <laughs> um, there was this, there's this book uh, called uh, Never Split the Difference by Christopher Voss. He, he's an ex FBI negotiator. He's the guy that you would call up um, if, you know, your teenage daughter was partying somewhere and, you know, got kidnapped by some people. Like he was the guy who you would call. Um, he says the art of negotiation, as most people think of it, is incorrect, where it's like two people enter a room, one person strong arms the other person, they walk out with everything they needed in the deal and this person's left head in their hands. In order for that to work, one person needs to walk into the room with all the leverage, right? And, it, and we think of jujitsu in very much the same way, right? You have your technique, I have my technique, we're gonna go at it and you know see who comes out on top. It's a very, it's a very shallow way of thinking of the art, right? It's just, it's, we're, it's, a, it's still a knockdown, drag out affair, but we're using techniques to do it, right? Instead, it's, it's something a lot more strategic than that, right? The true art of negotiation is two people walk into a room and one guy says, how can I help you? I want to help you get everything that you want, right? But in so doing, this guy also helps himself. And that's the way I think of jujitsu, right? When I am doing jujitsu, I'm not trying to beat you because... I combat you. Um, I beat you because I co-opt all of your ambition, right? You want to do this? Cool. I want to help you do that too. Um, when you do that though, I'm going to get this, right? And if I can change the battlefield, right? Um, it's like, it's like a D-Day, right? I, I sent a small troop over here. You think most of the battle is going to happen over there. The war is taking place over here. That's the second definition of capitalize, right? They may do. They may switch strategies and give you some extra territory. They may come with an overwhelming force, in which case you're going to redirect that energy and you'll you'll change where the battlefield is. The last definition of capitalize is the one that we most often go for as kind of like um, if we're not artists and we only know one note. This is the note we play most often. It's when your partner does nothing. Um, you're allowed then to choose whatever you want. So like if I have established control and I've got good tension, good awareness, and I've confounded you a lot, um, but you decide to do nothing, that's the only circumstance in which I would recommend 
then taking stock of like what you want to do and then trying that provided that if any of the first two cases crop up, they take precedence, right? And so with these three definitions, if you can switch between them fluidly and appropriately, right? Knowing when it's overwhelming, knowing when he's giving something up for free and knowing when you're allowed to do something, if you can switch between them um, fluidly, you're a, you're a well-tuned machine, that's when people seem impossible to kill when they're on defense and just unrelenting when on offense. And it doesn't have to do with speed necessarily. There's a guy, um, there's an instructor at our school, uh, Alex Stewart. I think he's one of the um, one of the fastest black belts under the Gracie brothers. Um, he's just phenomenal. Uh, every time he rolls with somebody, big, small, athletic or not, when they touch him, for some reason, the sparring all of a sudden goes at whatever pace Alex wants it to go at. And usually it's slow and it's slow, but it's, it's, it's like watching a train wreck in slow motion. It's slow and, and mesmerizing and, and perversely beautiful because any moment you think you, you have a, a chance to rest, that's when he kicks into, okay, I'm gonna do what I want now. And then when you start to react to what he's doing, he's gonna make you see that it's an overreaction. And then um, when you try to measure yourself and not overreact to things, he's gonna make you see that you're underplaying your hand, right? If you can adopt the right strategy, a person is always overplaying their hand, underplaying their hand, or not in the game enough, right? And uh, that is, that's the real art to me. Like if I can, if I can dismantle a person, not, not through my choices and my strategy, and not necessarily an asymmetry in athleticism, of course, or even knowledge, right? Uh, how is it that the, how is it that Hodger Gracie gets everybody in a cross choke? You know that's his move. You know he's good at gi chokes, but he's still gonna get you in it, right? Um, it's the depth of knowledge and the choices he makes along the way, not necessarily, um, you know, the, the, the idea that you don't know what it takes for a cross choke to happen, right? So long-winded answer for how I try to inject the artistry into it. So the, the article that I recommend you start with is uh, Jiu-Jitsu Microcosmos Part 3. Like I tried to start it, the ideas of connection and do kind of like a slow build, but then I had a kid and I'm like, I have no time for anything. So <laughs> I was like, get one video out there. It's, it's definitely like I could go on for hours and hours and hours about each and every aspect of the triple c framework um but uh, i tried to get it out in sort of a i don't know if you have this in the uk cliff notes you know when you're uh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so quick reference um that's that's the framework that i follow so i touch hands with somebody i don't know what's going to happen but the first things first things first create some tension right um if they're mounted on me Sometimes I have my elbows in the knees and my hands just shadowing the hands. Like they're on top here. Mm -hmm. um, just so that their hands don't get to do, do any movement for free, I put a hand over hand and I push it to their body, right? So that if their hand were to slip out, not only do I know it's gonna slip out, when it's gonna slip out and which way it's gonna go, but I can then get something for free. Cause if they're annoyed enough by this to try and move their hand this way, then their hands are far from their hips. My fist can go into the hips. I can bridge my hips and start pushing them out, right? Um, this, the thing that's gonna be difficult for people to get on realizing, even if you completely subscribe to the principles in the article, is the scale on which it happens. Um, do you guys have Monopoly? Yeah. Okay. So one of, the, one of the esoteric rules of Monopoly is that if someone lands on a property and they don't want to buy it, it can go on an auction block and possibly get sold for cheaper than the listed price, right? Um, if you've ever played with that annoying friend where um, let's say it goes, on, it goes on the auction block for 100 pounds, they'll say, okay, 100. And then you'll bid 150 and they'll bid 151. And then you'll bid 200 and you'll bid 201, right? Beating a person is an either or proposition. You don't have to beat them by a lot. 
And so anytime I run into a roadblock in applying this framework, I look for the next incremental piece that I can take, right? And I have, I have to ditch the ego and the expectation uh, of anything further until it becomes more possible, right? It's, it's a weird kind of surrender where I understand that, that I don't have ultimate control of anything except the decisions that I make. So um, if you're mounted and I have my hand shadow in your hands and my elbows in your knees and you decide to do nothing, then maybe I can do nothing at that moment. You're not giving me enough commitment to, um, to redirect your energy. You're not giving me enough opportunity uh, or free territory. It's kind of odd, but by doing nothing, you're the most enigmatic um, opponent you can be. And I don't want to overextend myself in trying to, in, in being led around by the nose, by my ambition, you know? Um, and you can kind of tell when that happens sometimes. Like sometimes I'll be rolling with a uh, purple belt or even a blue belt. There's this strange phenomena like uh, that I've talked about with my other black belt friends where we have more frustration with a purple or a blue belt than a brown belt, right? And the only difference being perhaps that we have an inflated expectation about what we should accomplish. And so we start making less wise choices about when to expend our energy and where to do things, right? Inflated expectations say you should be able to do more of what you want. When really it was never about what you want, it's about what's being made available to you and you making the best decisions as you go. Yeah, making the best decisions. Sense. Alex, <clears throat> so making the best decisions, how, how far along the jujitsu journey do you think people are when they've got enough kind of techniques, physical awareness to be able to make the right decisions at the right times? I think you can start honing it as soon as like late blue belt or early purple belt. So the idea is like, um, you, by the time you're a purple belt, you've seen, I'll say it's safe to say you've seen perhaps 95% of everything that will eventually become your game, right? There's new things being invented all the time, but the, the difference in knowledge base between a purple belt and a black belt is minuscule, I feel. You know, like I, um, <clears throat> let's see if I have it here. Uh, yeah, right here. So I had this, this day job that I got right out, or this job that I got right out of uh, university. Um, I was extremely bored, hated it. Um, but every day I went to, every night I went to jujitsu, every, every day during the day, it looked enough like work to where I would open up my notebook and I do a brain dump of like the techniques that I learned the previous night, right? I did a brain dump. And so like these start in 2008. Um, you can see I got like so everywhere a corner's dug out, that's a different position. And everywhere that there's a little black, little black tick, that is a different concern within that position. So this might be like uh, guard retention. This might be guard passing. This might be guard sweeps. This might be guard defense, you know, whatever. Um, I filled up the book with every technique uh, within the span of probably like three or four years, right? like uh, the time it takes from when you start to maybe early, late blue belt, early purple belt. And then the, the, the notes started to become repetitive. And I was like, man, it, where's, the, where's the silver bullet that's supposed to make me better now, right? Where's that, where's that next thing? Um, and it wasn't, you'll hear it everywhere. It, it's not a new technique that you need. It's being better at the ones that you have and learning how to apply it better. Um, so, to answer your question, I think you can start honing it at purple belt. At purple belt, you have, or, or late blue belt, you have, you have a lot of techniques. And frequently the problem is not so much, um, did I have a tech, like when you look back at your role, after the role is over, did I have a technique for it? Yeah, you did, right? The problem was um, accessing it in a timely manner mm -hmm. and being able to pivot when needed. Right, because if you know a move and I know a move and we go at each other, if that move is like say five steps, by the time I get to step three, you know what I'm up to and um, you're not gonna let four and five happen, right? Mm -hmm. If however, if however, I notice that the first three steps of this technique 
are, or uh, step three of this technique can plug into step, you know, four of this technique and I switch strategies halfway, then you're busy stopping me from doing this move while I'm off doing this move. How, do, how does one do that? And it's just practice. You have to, um, you have to kind of leave the ideas of technique behind. Technique is, is, is the solution, but it's also the new problem. It's the solution in that without technique, we would be flailing about just kind of, uh, you know, uh, taking shots in the dark. It's the it's the new problem because it sets a it sets an expectation of the minimum acceptable progress, right? If if I'm to recompose my guard, you're inside mount, and I'm trying to recompose guard. I've got my elbows bracing your body. I need a bridge, shrimp out, shoot my legs in. Um, square up with you, like uh, align our spines and then wrap my, my bottom leg around your back, right? That's a tall order. That's a tall order on anybody who knows what they're doing, right? But if I forget the technique of recomposing guard, um, then I'm free to do anything that, that uh, has whatever I accomplish initially as the ingredients. So let's say all I can do is bridge and brace there's not enough room for my legs. Um, I will forget about bringing the legs in and I will just hold you where you are. I want to see your reaction. I want to see what you're going to give me. And if you give me nothing while you're out that far, then maybe I continue to walk my legs away from you until we, until we're parallel. And then I just shove you over onto your back. Right. Um, if I start with the technique, the technique, if I start from the, the, the mindset where I'm trying for this technique, when I inevitably get cut short, then my resilience, my ability to transition into something else is gonna be, is gonna be uh, negatively impacted. But if I start from a place of, I get what I get, and um, let's just see where this goes, then uh, you, know, you kind of, you leave yourself open to the, infinite possibilities that are out there, you know? It's like when you, when you, when you go see a movie that you were looking forward to, um, but it doesn't quite meet expectations, it's rather disappointing sometimes. And sometimes you go out to see a movie just because you're bored and you know nothing about it, you never even see the trailer and you walk away thinking that was surprisingly good, right? <laughs> like if you um, have your life completely mapped out, it might be, if you start a piece of art, you know, from a coloring book, it might be beautiful in the end, but it'll only ever be what it was originally designed to be. But you can start with a blank piece of paper and come up with something that no one could have even imagined before, right? That's what I'm trying to do in the jujitsu. There are things that guide micro decisions, like, oh, um, don't let him settle into a side mount, right? Don't let him, don't let him, uh, Pedro Sauer says, park the car. Don't let him park a car on top of you. Um, but if all you can do is keep them from parking the car right now and you can't get out right now, fine, bide your time, right? If he does nothing, inch forward. If he does something, decide whether or not he's overplaying his hand or underplaying his hand and work accordingly. There was a, um, there's another guy, uh, another instructor, uh, he owns his own school now, um, but he came up maybe a year or two after me. His name is Mike Everett and that guy's phenomenal. He got his blue belt and purple belt after me, but got his brown belt and black belt before me. And at a certain, so at a certain point, there was this, there was this inflection point in his progress where it just took off. And uh, I remember it well. I remember he, it just seemed like he had a certain kind of magic to him where uh, even, even in the stages where I was better than him, um, I remember one sparring session where I caught him in like six arm locks you know, in the span of like six minutes. But I walked away feeling kind of terrible because it felt like he had stolen from me, right? Let's like, shoot, Those, the, that's the last time I arm like that guy, you know? And then flash forward a couple of years, he, um, where he kind of started to surpass me, I remember we were sparring and he was throwing up these arm locks on me and I was defending them properly. And I thought, okay, not today. Like, you're not gonna get my number today. So, you know, first five arm locks defended easily. Last arm lock, he got me. 
I was like, well, how, what the fuck? Like, I, like, how did he get this, this last arm lock, right? He, he had been strategizing, you know? Um, when I threw up arm locks on him the couple years prior, he was learning all the ins and outs, all my favorite things. He would, he would fail, but he would fail systematically. Oh, I can't sit up because he does this. Oh, I can't pull my elbow to the ground because he does this. When he was throwing up arm locks on me, um, he probably expected me to defend two, three, four, five times, right? The only difference between a sixth arm lock and the first was that I was six times as tired. He was only 10% serious in his first six attempts. And in his last one, he threw it on maybe 50% and he knew my five best exits. You know what I mean? So like he out jujitsu me and that, that was the thing of beauty. And so it's, um, it's always intriguing to me when I like see a Pedro Sauer seminar or something like that, where you see the wisdom of old masters and it's not even in just their technique, but how they apply it to where it seems so, it's not even complicated. It's not like some worm guard or anything like that. It's just, it's beautiful, it's elegant, it's simple, but it's effective. And all it requires of you is that you don't be too headstrong about what you need to happen. If you're just open to what your opponent may do and you work with them, um, it's a lot easier sometimes. The two black belts then that you mentioned, uh, uh -huh. Alex Stewart and- Mike Everett, yeah. Everett. So how much of that is, uh, is just the natural ability versus you know, being able to be taught a good question so, oh, I would never mm, so there's there's no doubt that a thing like natural ability exists like some people seem to get it right um if such a person exists I'm 100% convinced that I am not that person like um I uh, I played baseball in high school but uh, like all four years, but to, to be fair, I was there to basically raise the team's GPA. Um, <clears throat> uh, so I, I don't consider myself an athlete by any means or someone who's very intuitive by any means. Like I said, I gravitated toward the things where you had definite answers, mm -hmm. you know, math, science, things like that, things that don't necessarily demand creativity or improv, you know, like, um, you guys, you guys have had uh, Whose Line Is It Anyway, right? Was that a UK show? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. right? Think about that. Like, it, could there be such a thing as natural comedic genius? Perhaps. Um, but no doubt that a lot, that anything can be practiced, you know? Anything can be practiced, including creativity, including the, including the stuff that we consider um, just intangible and 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 mysterious you know that's been that's been my goal as a teacher uh you know in the last handful of years and when i first started teaching it was all about can i get this student to this knowledge base right and then with time their reflexes will get better they'll make better decisions etc but now i'm trying to codify and 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 create a curriculum for creativity itself you know um because it's once you get to that level where it's where it's art and not just um, you know right or wrong, then it's it's a lot more liberating. It, it feels a lot more playful, you know, like it's supposed to be. Some days it's a grind, you know, hit the gym, lift this much weight, you know, whatever. And but if it's if it's all momentum and no drive, then the joy is sucked out, right? Like. If you, if you wake up in the morning and decide this is what I want to do today and you do it, it feels great. If you wake up in the morning and, and, and it's like, this is what I have to do today, you can accomplish it, but it doesn't feel as satisfying when you go to sleep at night. It's like, okay, I got the laundry list done, but you know, it's, 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 not, it's perhaps not what I would have chosen to do if I had a free choice, you know? Um, I don't, so to answer your question, I don't, I, I do believe a thing such as natural talent exists but I also believe it's nothing that you can't practice for. It's nothing that you can't work on. Um, a, one, one amazing book I read uh, a few years back was called The Charisma Myth, I think it was called. Um, and basically it was about how 
we think of charisma as one of these intangibles. You have it or you don't. And the whole premise of the book is, no, you, this is a thing that can be practiced. And here are some, here are some basic principles. And there was an anecdote in there about um, uh, Marilyn Monroe. And she was speaking with a, a journalist as they were riding the subway in New York. And um, she, was, she was kind of explaining this idea that she could flip a switch and turn into Marilyn, or she could flip it off and be, I think her name is Norma Jean Baker, something like that, right? And the journalist was a little incredulous. He's like, I, okay, yeah, you, you can flip on and off. And she's like, yeah. So they, they exit the subway, they're on street level, and uh, she's like, do you wanna see Marilyn? And he's like, yeah, have at it, right? She takes her hair down, she, you know, flips her collar a little bit. All of a sudden, passersby stop and they start, they're, they're attracted to her. And then in, within the span of a couple of minutes, the journalist can't get anywhere near her anymore, right? So um, I, think, I think anything can be practiced, anything can. And I, um, that's one of the great things that I've gotten from jujitsu, right? Because you, Life before jujitsu is work really, really hard. And if you can, you can. And if you can't, either work harder or, or maybe it wasn't possible to begin with. And you're, you're left with this, shoot, well, which one is it, right? I would like to know if it's not meant for me so that I can just invest my time better, you know? Um, but jujitsu shows you that sometimes even the things that you thought were impossible are possible. If you are not so committed to the path in which you're supposed to take, but rather just stay committed to the goal, right? That's a quote from uh, Nietzsche. He's like, many men are committed in the paths they have chosen, but few in the goal, right? You wanna be happy. Well, it's like, okay, um, get a job with high income and then you'll be able to relax uh, in your retirement, right? And you're like, all right, I'm gonna be a doctor, but I hate organic chemistry. This is true, by the way. Like I, I, I started as a chemical engineer and I hated organic chemistry. And it's like, okay, well, I can tough this out and get my degree and then go to uh, med school and then be miserable for the next, you know, 40 years. And then when I retire, I can begin my life. Or I can listen to things that might not be a strong pull, right? Maybe not like this all-encompassing passion that I know is going to lead me down the right path in life forever. But it's like, you know, I, I always thought guitar was a little cool. Like, okay, pick it up, play with it, see where it goes, right? Don't have this, um, don't have this predefined expectation of what you must accomplish and when you must accomplish it by for it to mean something, right? So um, yeah, jujitsu taught me how to be liberated in accepting the things that I can't control and focusing all that, all that attention and intent for the things that I want, right? Um, and when you do that, you find that you're much more resilient and flexible and creative than you could have ever imagined. You know, it, you just, you, there's no, everybody wants the certainty of a prescription so that you can, you can follow these procedures and become this, right? But in any pursuit, it, there are people in your job right now, whatever job you have, who have better degrees, better educations, but they make the worst decisions and they're not very good at what they do, right? Um, but then there are people who uh, perhaps never had a formal education in what they do, uh, but they figured it out as they go. They, they uh, to quote Bruce Lee, he's like, you know, what did he say? Um, he's talking about uh, assimilating technique, right? Take what's effective, get rid of what's unnecessary, add what is essentially your own, right? If we do everything that way, then I don't think there's anything that we want that we can't find a way to, or at least that's the way I'm going to try to lead my life. So you, if I'm wrong, if I'm wrong I, 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 I went out swinging. I was, I was gonna go back to, it's just rewind a little bit almost. When you were talking about sort of your ways of, uh, when you're going through the three C's and you're doing mm -hmm. that when you're rolling, mm -hmm. are you, um, how much of that do you think is is um, unconscious from the, the point of view of like you've, you've done that technique so many times that it's muscle memory mm -hmm. and how much, it might be difficult to quantify, but like how much of that is then conscious thought? 
So that's so fascinating. <clears throat> For those, um, do, you, do you guys do anything else creative? Uh, we talked about instruments before, but like, uh, do you guys paint, draw, dance, write? Not massively, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, Apart from guitar. Okay. Um, it's hard to say, like, Undoubtedly, the time that I've spent on the mat and the knowledge base does inform me as to my options, right? Um, it does. The most fun roles I have, however, are ones where I do things and I'm like, that should be a technique, right? I should, I should, that should be something I teach, right? It was never taught to me, but it was discovered by me, probably by other people as well. And I'm like, that should be a technique. Um, my only, uh, what I would say is my only conscious thought goes into the framework. Whatever, whatever technique comes to me is probably the unconscious, unconscious part. Um, I hardly ever think in terms of a full technique. I might think of a small thing, a very, very small thing. Sometimes a guy is um, I'm mounted and his hands are tight, elbows tight, hands by the neck, which is smart, right? Hands by the neck so that, you know, he can worry about chokes, elbows tight so that there's no arm locks wrist locks possible. Um, the largest thought I have is cross grip here, grab this, yank it up just an inch so that I can tuck my other hand in here. And then I just do this, right? And then once I'm there, I can do this, but I don't even think that, I don't even think in terms of once he goes here, then you can start to pin the wrist. I just think, get this thing. Because mm -hmm. in, a, in, a, in a moment's notice, this might not be the appropriate prescription anymore. Right, he may bump in a way where I, I want to do something different. So, all conscious thought is given to my framework, and the unconscious just comes in uh, as I'm trying to apply the framework. Um, so, similar, similar question, but maybe asked slightly differently. I mean, you, you said that technique is 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 important to kind of give people a, a base. But at some point, technique becomes a problem. At what point do you start to encourage people to kind of, I don't want to say throw away the technique, but kind of just go with what's there and what's available? At what point do you do you encourage that? This is interesting. <clears throat> um, right away. It's fascinating. Like technique is great for you to understand the motions that are effective and the principles that make it work. As soon as you get into sparring, I so we have... Um, three types of classes for adults. Uh, sorry, that's, there's four. There's a women's only, which I'm not gonna consider right now. There's a beginner, advanced, and there's this one in between class that we have that's still considered part of the uh, beginner curriculum that we call reflex development. Um, because as you're learning your initial 36 moves, it's not enough to know them individually. We, we have to know how to blend them together in a cohesive way so that when a fight gets picked with us, it's not a series of, you know, looking up your, going through your Rolodex, looking at your index cards. You have to, you have to know it in your bones. In those classes, those reflex development classes, that's where I start um, layering in the ideas, maybe not of ditching technique, but of not allowing technique to dictate everything that you do. So uh, imagine you all are mounted on a person and uh, I'm the person on the bottom and I begin bringing my hand in between us and rolling to my knees. The move is to take my back, right? We all know that. The problem is, is as it's taught, uh, as I start moving to my side and getting up on all fours, <clears throat> you're thinking, okay, move on top of him, get the hooks in and get your, get your seat belt, get your over under. When you think in terms of that technique, and you allow it to dictate you that way, you become very light. So if this person has an explosive get up, right? You, very, you may very well be thrown off of them before you have a chance to get your hooks in. If however, you stay here like, uh, I don't know, like honey, like molasses, and they start to roll and you're just a dead body, right? And you have slight input here and there just to make sure that you stay on top and that you're not pulled underneath them, you can, feel like you can make yourself feel like a wet blanket so that they slow down, like as explosive as they want to be, that role that's normally like this becomes this, right? You slow the fight down. 
Um, you have them drain extra energy. And when they get where they want to go and you tuck your hooks in, then they realize, man, that's probably not what I wanted at all. Right. Um, so I, I start right away. Right. Technique is great when it, when it makes new options available to your mind, your mind is now uh, suddenly aware of it, but if it dictates every one of your motions and when you do them, then it's a problem. Um, this is very apparent in open guard, by the way. I never had a great open guard. Uh, I didn't understand people who did. Um, one of my friends used to take a uh, private lessons with Alex Stewart. And one of the funniest things he said is, Alex Stewart feels heavy when he's on the bottom, right? And it's like, I know exactly what he means because you, he could start an open guard. You'll start in his open guard right here. You slap hands and all of a sudden he's this black hole where it's like, oh shit, like, uh, like I don't want to go over this way, but I'm going to get, I'm going to go over that way. Right. And I know if I fight it, I'm going to fall into this triangle. And if I jump away from that entirely, well, then I'm, I'm going to go as an overhead sweep. Something's going to happen. Right. And it's not because he knows what he wants to do. I mean, he's probably practiced those sequences a lot, but he's open to anything that you are going to give him. In the meantime, however, his connection is fantastic. His pulls are solid. He doesn't give you anything for free. If you decide to just stay there, he's going to pull a little extra. If you decide to pull away, that might become a push, right? You're always going to underplay. You're always going to overplay. Um, sorry, I lost, I lost my train of thought there. Like the original question was... <laughs> Was it mine or Pete's? Um, no, that was yours. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I can't even remember, but it's fascinating to listen to you talk. Uh, what point do you, do you encourage people to throw away technique? Right, just right, right. Essentially, essentially right away. Uh, I don't want you, when you're out there, um, the last, the last uh, you know, uh, Pedro Sauer seminar in Iceland, don't do jujitsu, understand jujitsu is what he says, right? And if you understand it, it's not so much the art of throwing this technique in followed by this one and this one and this one. It is um, understanding your opponent and using everything they want in a way that benefits you, right? You wanna get to your knees, perfect. I need to climb up onto your back. So you're gonna pick me up onto your back, right? I'm not gonna pick myself up, you're gonna pick me up. And I hitchhike off of your energy, off of your intent all the time. Um, that's, yeah, technique should inform, but it shouldn't dictate. Um, in the same way that if you learn musical scales, they should inform you of what notes are safe within a certain chord progression. But if all I did was play up and down scales, that hardly makes for a song, right? <clears throat> that makes sense. It's for, there's still one thing that you said, uh, maybe you can like, obviously for, for our guys that will be listening and stuff, that weren't there you said something that goes through my head all the time now when i'm rolling and that's where when we're in iceland which is just put them in a smaller box yeah and literally yeah. that runs through my head constantly now when i'm rolling i'm like right just put them in a smaller box make the box smaller make the box and that's kind of yeah that was the big enduring thing from iceland mm -hmm. that's great it's it's a different thing every time for for the different seminars that i do but yeah it's that incremental mindset right um we're so, because of this quarantine, uh, I have a little bit more time to exercise, honestly. Like we're still allowed to go out as long as we keep our distance and everything. And um, one thing I hate with a passion is running. Um, but uh, but if, I, if I ditch the expectation, I'm like, just get started, right? Get started and you will automatically be ahead of the person that you were before you started to think, I need to run at least this many miles in at least this much time. Um, you know, if you just get started, you're on your way. Um, and then, you know, when I'm feeling extra tired, it's like, okay, either end of the end of the block, can't get to the end of the block, get to that next driveway, get to that next house. Um, when you do that, you find you have a lot more in reserve than, than you know, your expectation or, or than your, um, then you would have been able to believe if you just stuck to whatever your ambition was dictating, right? So this smaller box thing is great because to me, it's not about making the best decision with the, the, um, with the knowledge of everything that's to come. Nobody can see what's, good, what's to come, but I can do the best thing right now, 
right? I can do the best for me right now. And if it so happened that it didn't turn out my way, then that mindset is still going to keep me, is still going to groom me for the next great opportunity. You know, if they say luck is when preparation meets opportunity, it's always being prepared, right? Um, and yeah, so when you get, when you, when you, let's say you're mounted on a person, their elbows came up a little bit and you start to slide your hips behind an elbow, you may not see the perfect opportunity to pivot fully and, and, and go for an arm bar just yet. But if you can keep them from getting their elbow to the ground, at least right now, they struggle for a couple of seconds and then they pause and they're like, shoot, what do I do now? That's your moment to go. Right. It's, um, uh, we have this, this game at uh, grade school children play and certain childish adults um, where like you, it's hot hands, right? One person has their hands on the bottom, one hands on the top and you're doing this quick, like slap them on the hand kind of thing. You can slap them, you stay on the bottom. If you miss, then you switch positions, right? Um, we're all trying to slap each other constantly, right? It's, it's very inelegant and it's, there's no strategy to it. The smart people lull you into a sense of stability or instability where they'll go like this, and you make, it makes you flinch, right? And uh, with, I used to play this with my kids uh, in, in the kids' classes just to keep them from eating each other before class began. Um, I would do this and they go back. And then when they're resetting, their mind is in reset mode, right? And that's the perfect time to slap them because they're like, oh, this isn't part of the game they're thinking, right? Same thing is true. That's what, is, that's what the, uh, the, the whole smaller box idea is, is that, um, you know, I, you know I've started an arm lock, but you don't know where it's gonna end. You don't know when it's gonna end. So how can you be continuously vigilant the whole time, right? Because they know it, you know it. Um, who can outmaneuver the other person by staying calm at the right moments and then seizing territory at the right moments? Um, the people who are, and this is the ironic thing, is like the people who are the calmest are the hardest for me to roll with. They're the most enigmatic because it feels like everything I'm doing is me being led by my ambition and me not taking advantage of something that they're giving me. And therefore I'm sticking my neck out to try and accomplish something. Um, yeah, the incremental mindset is huge. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, that's all I think about now when I'm trying, I'm just, yeah, that just stuck for some reason that was, one of the things that stuck the stuck the hardest from that year for some reason that was just what kind of fantastic stayed, stayed with being me. on the receiving end of being put into a smaller and smaller box constantly by Pete and it's not much fun to be on the end of. <laughs> it's it's infuriating in a sense because if he just dove after what he wanted, then it would provide you a little bit more opportunities, right? Yeah, right. There would be there would be a lot more. He would definitely be overplaying too many things and then there would be a certain looseness. There's, <clears throat> there's a frightening aspect to this slow motion destruction that you'll feel with certain people where it's like, you know, there's no moment of rest. Um, it's not to say that I'm gonna die in the next second, but I can't see myself getting out for the next few hours. And, and you know, death over the next few hours is, is definitely scarier than uh, the next couple of seconds. <laughs> So, so when you're being put into that smaller and smaller box yourself, Alex, what do you think of, you know, to, to get out of it? Incremental mindset. What is the next smallest bit that is achievable, right? If you want to do a thousand pushups in a row and you try to add on a hundred a day, you, you die, right? You get to your max and then you try one more. If you can't do one more, then hold a plank as long as you can, right? It's like, if you can't run, you walk. If you can't walk, you crawl. If you can't crawl, you roll right? <laughs> if, you, if you can't do that, you're going to figure something else out. Um, it's, and what's funny is um, it doesn't take much to turn the table sometimes, right? If you can, um, let's see, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go off. I have so many metaphors just because uh, there's just so many things I've, not that I've done, but that I'm interested in and, and know on a very novice level. Um, if you have a computer processor and you give it a task, right? It'd say like, uh, I'm gonna represent time by the distance between my fingers. It takes this long to complete a task, right? The, the processor doesn't start the next task, however long it is until this one is done. There's no interrupts here, 
right? It does this and then it does this single thread. Okay. Um, I have one of those processors. You have one of those processors. If I need to get more done than you, then I need to take the tasks that look like this while you're taking the tasks that look like this. Right. Mm -hmm. So if, you know, uh, one of the last classes that I was able to attend of his before uh, we had to go on our, on our, on our quarantine, um, a guy's mounted on you, or sorry, he's on your back. You, you roll to your knees. He took your back. He flattened you out. Right. Um, doesn't happen often, but it's bad. It's really bad. He's flattened you out and he's got an arm around your neck, hand behind the shoulder. Right. Defense is from there. What could you imagine? What could possibly happen there that you could that you could dream of, right? You would say, okay, tap, taps what's next. But that mindset is setting an expectation. It, it, it's following an expectation that uh, a, a proper defense looks like getting getting him off your back. It doesn't. The proper defense just keeps you from dying for this much longer. So what he don't will do is he'll go like this. And he'll use whatever he can, his hips, his knees, and he'll, he'll bulldoze his chest weight over your arm. And believe it or not, when both of us are laying on an arm that is just inches away from actually sealing the neck, but being here is incredibly frustrating. And there's a lot of squeeze you can put into it that still just doesn't close that gap. That's step one, right? That is step one, right? And then What's fascinating to me is there are other parts of the technique. Here's how um, you're going to work your way to the wrist and you're going to grab him by the thumb, right? Because, or uh, the meat under the thumb, right? The thumb itself can slip out, but you grab the meat under the thumb um, because that's where you have the maximum torque, right? That's the longest lever. You start to pull that down, okay? And then um, if his hooks are in, or if his hooks are in the legs, you have to get one of your legs inside a hook. Like, I don't know if you can see here. If his hooks are in, you have to get one leg inside a hook, right? So that you can flatten yourself out and you want to turn and face the elbow. So if this was his arm and I was able to pull it down to here, I want to get this leg out of a hook and I want to start turning toward that elbow. Because once I do, like, if I turn toward the elbow and I'm able to get this shoulder pointed at his chest, then there is no choke anymore, right? Now, this is not to say he's not mounted on you still or not still on your back or that you're not inches from being able to be rolled back onto your stomach and, and, and shot back in the choke if you make some uh, hasty maneuver. But it is an example of the incremental mindset applied everywhere. And there are moves that I don't, I've not seen an appropriate defense for. Like, um, you know, uh, everybody's into the, ever since the, the great success of like the Danaher death squad and stuff like that, everybody's like, we've been ignoring leg locks way too much right? There are times where I'm completely tied up in the legs and I don't know the defense in terms of, I don't know how to get out, but I do know how heel hooks work. And I do know that if I can prevent this little thing from happening, I will survive for a little while longer. And sometimes a person, if they get 99% of a move, they, they get so invested in grabbing that next 1% right now, has to be right now. The urgency is to, is to kill right now that they they do something too hasty and then they leave a large opening for me to take more and then when i take that more it's very important that i am always centered i don't get i don't get led around by my, my ambition i take what's available when it's available so if i can get you off my heel just enough for you not to heel hook me perfect i don't need to worry about extricating my legs and getting on top of you right now i just need to keep you away i need to preserve the space that i've able i was able to achieve and then when you try to work your way around that, you'll once again provide too much space, hopefully, right? But there are many times, in fact, you know, going back to uh, Peter's uh, question from earlier, when I, there's so many times that I specifically remind myself not to try and do a technique and instead to do what's gonna be most troublesome to my, to my partner, you know? Um, that's most of what I do, most of what I do. And a bunch of those little moments strung together is what makes up a role. You know, it'll make sense when you look back and you, when you replay the tape, it, it's easy to say, oh man, Robin had this move in his mind the whole time, but he didn't, he didn't. He had fractions of a move that happened to add up to that move, 
You know what I mean? So like, I remember as a white belt watching two brown belts spar and eventually person A beats person B. And I was just, I was astounded. I was like, how, how did that guy think 10 steps ahead of that other guy? Like, how did he know? And the, the, the point is he didn't. You can't think 10 steps ahead, that's impossible. What you can try to do is from a moment to moment basis, stay one step ahead and have that happen 10 times in a row. So cumulatively in the aggregate, things happen in your favor, but they're based on these really, really tiny, like incremental decisions that are achievable, right? If, if I, if, again, if I'm going to do the thousand pushups and I can't do one more, trying to do one more is not going to make me any better. Holding my plank probably will because that part is achievable, right? If I, if I'm met with failure, 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 I need to take smaller bites. And so does that sometimes not add up to enough? Absolutely. Alex Stewart will find a way to slow burn his way through my defenses, however good they are and however many tiny little hurdles I can throw in his way, he will get me. He will get me. But this incremental mindset is powerful in that it keeps me present enough to see how he got to me, right? So that I can, add, I can throw one more thing in his way next time, right? And similarly, if I'm present, whatever works on you can work for you. So I'm like, oh, he, he starts to slowly lay his weight onto the wrist. So even though I'm blocking him with my elbows from side mount, he starts to roll his weight onto the wrist and there's no, there's no support right here. So it starts to crush my wrist like this. And then when I try to push him away with my elbow, he rolls his body to that side of my elbow. So it's, um, yeah, incremental mindset. Um, and the problem is people let the win or the loss dictate the quality of their role. Like it, it, their, their judgment of the quality of their role, which is, which is not right, right? You can fail forward and you can win and still go nowhere right? The, the win or the loss is not the ultimate determinant of, of how good that role was. Um, so yeah, when I'm put in a smaller box, I try to make myself into the kind of person that needs a tinier opening to escape that box, right? I don't need the same opening that I did before. I'll take the small one. Nice. Is that what you would, like, would that be one of your, because one of the, I think this is sort of some of the questions that some of the guys asked was like, is that what you would, prescribed for the for the beginners just just the tiny little wins the tiny little incremental things that you can do when you're first starting out yeah absolutely um i think one of the not to toot my own horn but i think one of the uh best parts of me uh teaching like one of the best things i do as a teacher is that um i i get people to see the value in the potential of the things they're doing, even though that in a, in a full, you know, knock down, drag out affair, it wouldn't necessarily work 100% of the time. Like in the reflex development classes, I, I get people to slow down. And when they can see the effectiveness when it's slow and they start to apply it when it starts to speed up, um, they can see how they can, how staying calm and collected and present and, and they, they see that it's A, a choice, and B, that that choice gives the, grants them more power than doing the right move at the right time at, at, as a reflex. You know what I mean? Like, um, if you do something that's a reflex, in a sense, you got lucky, right? You didn't control your way out of a situation. You, you got lucky, right? And it, for beginners, the, when the win or loss is the only metric of success, then that's good enough for them, right? Uh, I do, um, a few years ago, I never got good at it, but I got a little bit into rock climbing. And um, in the beginning, it's exciting to be high up on a wall and, uh, and, to, and to top out your route. And that's, that I could feel the beginner mindset. That's all that seemed to matter. Was I able to reach the top? right? Not how burnt out am I? Uh, and how elegant did that feel? And how easy were these motions? And how much did I lift myself by my legs and not by my arms, right? None of that really goes through the mind of a beginner sometimes. It's all about what was I able to accomplish? And you need a steady balance of both, you know? Like if you don't see the wins, you don't see the point. 
but at the same time, you have to, you have to find a way to make tangible the long-term benefits of, of uh, some much deeper practices, you know? Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and that, that will help the guys that are asking kind of, you know, you get that question a lot, don't you? You kind of get that question of kind of, well, oh, how should I, how should I do better against that blue belt or that purple belt or how can, you know, or what move, I mean, you kind of covered it, but what kind of moves do I need to get, you know, to stop that guy doing this to me? He always does this to me. How do I stop him doing that? Within Pedro Sowers Association, um, does he have a particular curriculum for, you know, white belt, blue belt and all that? Yeah, yeah. So there's a yeah, there's a white to blue curriculum, and then there's uh, the blue to purple curriculum, and then it kind of spreads out from there. So then it's uh, uh, it's like a load of other material that's available through the association and stuff like that as well. So yeah, yeah, similar similar kind of concept really. And obviously with us, with Professor Manganello being our instructor and our kind of mentor, then obviously he's on he's on both sides of the fence with Gracie Academy and with um, uh, or Grace University, sorry, and with Pedro Sauer. So, yeah, we mm -hmm. kind of get uh, a bit of best of both worlds in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we don't know all the all the stuff, do we? Clearly, but um, you know, we, we're pretty uh, up on the combatives and the kind of entry level stuff. So, when you're talking about reflex development and things like that, that's we it's it's it's, it's things we discussed with uh, Professor Allen. Yeah. Cool. Well, should we call that time? Alex, we won't take up too much more of your time. That's been awesome. Yeah. Hopefully I didn't blather too much. I tend to do that. No, it's perfect. Yeah. Right. I, was yeah, just it's perfect. Live. I was just looking at the comments from the people that have been watching it live on YouTube. Loads of comments about me looking like I'm out of Bohemian Rhapsody, just a head with no shoulders. <laughs> but also <laughs> lots of uh, comments about uh, fantastic insight, Alex. So, um, whilst they can't all join in on the Zoom, I think a lot of people are happy with uh, with the, the you know the stories you've been telling and the and the tips and the insights that you've given. So uh, so thank you so so much for that. It's fascinating for me to listen to you talk about it as well. I think when you were talking about the artistry, the only other person other than uh, Master Sauer that I've heard talk about artistry and those sorts of concepts was uh, Luis Heredia. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it was really interesting getting your take on some of those uh, those, those concepts as well. It was just fantastic. Kind of scares me now thinking that there were more people on this than just us four here. <laughs> <laughs> you suddenly don't, realize. Don't be scared. The comments were not that vast or extensive. There was you know, <laughs> se seven or eight, and they were more <laughs> taking the Mickey out. Wait, how many people you can only this? see? My I was face. eating. <laughs> There you go. Yeah. <laughs> a few comments. Know what's worse, the fact that my shoulders blend into the background or that my head blends into the background. You can't really tell the difference at either end. So. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. No, it's, no, it's great. It's, yeah, it's, built on, uh, it's built on loads of the stuff that we, yeah, that you talked about in Iceland as well. And uh, yeah, we'll get the guys to go and check out the, uh, the 3C stuff and get them to dive into that as well, for sure. Mm -hmm. Cool. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, Groundedgrit.com. It was great seeing you guys again, man. Yeah. Like, I've yet to meet you, Billy, but I can't wait. Um, once all of, all of this blows over, I need, to, I need to make a trip out to the UK. Yes, sir. Well, that was one of the requests, actually. Get this guy over and uh, let's learn some more about the three Cs. So, uh, yeah, really, really good. Awesome. Thank we you, did. Alex. I'll yeah, tell you what I'll do you now. Right. I'll... Um, whilst we're talking i'll just i'll just cut the uh the live feed on youtube somehow i've got to figure out how to do that technically here we go all right okay here we go okay guys uh, thank you very much for watching if you're watching live um and we will speak Bye, to you later.